Okay, let's get this started. Hello and welcome everyone to this Tech and Talk presentation today. My name is Markus Unger. I am from Germany and I'm currently enrolled in the 180 course of Launch School's core curriculum. Now my talk today is titled From a Small Idea to a Working Game Prototype in a Week. And that sounds catchy, but it also sounds a bit like one of those you know, random articles that you can find on medium.com that promise to teach you everything about programming in 15 minutes. But for this presentation, I'm not going to overpromise, and I'm going to try very hard not to under deliver. So over the course of the next, let's say 30 minutes, I want to show you how one small coding puzzle inspired me to actually build my very first uh, big application. Or let's say biggish application. It's actually not that large. Uh, it's just 2000 lines of code, which is in the end, not very much. And to be quite honest, it's not even the first one. It's just the first one that didn't end in an absolute disaster. But the point still stands. It was the first project where I successfully overcame certain obstacles. And in the process, I learned something about, for example, code organization. But also what's probably more interesting to you, I learned about some really neat algorithms that I want to show today. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can throw them in the chat box in Zoom, but I don't actually know if I'll see them during the presentation or I can answer them right now, but I'm definitely happy to answer any and all questions afterwards. And with that said, let's actually go back to last December. It was at that time that, it was, uh, that I was a participant in the advent of code, which is kind of an annual programming competition, but with less emphasis on the competition part. It's mostly a collection of 25 programming challenges, uh, one for each of the days leading up to Christmas. And those challenges focus very heavily on various data structures and algorithms. And as such, it was kind of a nice and lighthearted way to, you know, get my feet wet on those two topics. Now, there was one particularly difficult challenge about midway through the competition, and it revolved around a battle between Christmas elves and goblins in some sort of cave system, you know, the usual Christmas stuff. And please don't ask me how they actually got to that point in the story that gets told during Advent of Code. Uh, it was a bit silly, but what struck my imagination here was this complex cave system that you can see. Every participant in Advent of Code, and I knew that, gets its own unique and randomly generated challenge input. So I, know, I knew for sure that those caves, they had to be algorithmically generated. But, you know, they look so intricate and detailed, it almost felt like they were handcrafted. And this look and feel of those caves, this reminded me of a type of game that I like to play in the past, uh, which are the so-called roguelike games. Now, if you haven't heard of this term, let's have a quick lesson in the history of roguelikes. Roguelikes are named after their very old ancestor, which is a game called Rogue that was released in 1980. And one of its earliest successors was the immensely popular NetHack that you can see in the screenshot here. Now in all roguelike games, you control a hero character and that's usually represented by an ad symbol as you can see here, because you know all the graphics in those games, they're done by just using the ASCII character set. Now in NetHack, you explore a dungeon that's comprised of a number of rooms, uh, you slay monsters, you find treasures, you get stronger, at some point you'll probably die, you know, all the good stuff you're doing in games. And Rogue and NatHack would eventually spawn a whole genre of games that follow their core principles. And one of the most important of those principles is that of procedural generation. Now, what does that mean? Procedural generation means that game data is generated algorithmically and not manually by hand. So in NetHack, for example, every time you start a new game, the rooms that you have to explore are randomly generated. And they might look completely different from your last game, just like every cave in the Advent of Code challenge uh, actually looks different. Now, it was pure chance that I had played around with another algorithm during one of Advent of Code's earlier challenges. And in order to explain how basically that got things rolling, I wanna quickly walk you through a type of algorithm that's called cellular automata. That's a big and heavy word. Now, cellular automata are just a kind of model that's represented in a two-dimensional structure. Like for example, a grid of cells, you know this uh, from like a checkerboard or a graph paper. 
And each cell in this grid can have one state, for example, on or off or uh, one or zero or living or dead, anything basically. And the whole grid gets transformed repeatedly with each transforming step creating a new generation of cells. And the state of this cell is then determined by some predefined rules. And if that sounds a bit too abstract, uh, let's look at what is unarguably the most popular implementation of a cellular automaton. And that would be Conway's game of life. Now, what you see here is a visual representation of uh, this grid that I've mentioned. What you see are living cells in black. And those cells evolve thanks to some rules that we define. Now, it's actually not hard to write the code for this. Uh, really, this was, uh, this was very simple stuff. And I think it produces some of the coolest visual results that you can get even when you're still very early on in your journey to learn programming. Now, to give you a better understanding for the role that this algorithm plays in the creation of my game, let's dive into how this actually works and how some simple rules can create, like from the chaos that you can see at the beginning, uh, there are evolving patterns that you can see here. Something somehow makes sense after a few generations. So let's look at uh, how this actually works. We start with an empty grid. And for this explanation, I'm just going to choose a small grid, like four by four cells. Uh, in Ruby terms, we could represent this, for example, with a nested array, but I don't actually want to get into the implementation details here. This is just about the mental model of how this works. So we have our grid. And next, we need an initial configuration, or what's called a seed. And this just determines randomly for each cell in the grid which of two states it has. Is it a living cell or is it a dead one? And in this example, living cells are colored in yellow and dead cells remain just transparent. Now the core of the algorithm is a simple loop. And in that loop, we compose a new grid by looking at all the individual cells in the current grid and applying some rules in regards to the number and type of neighbors that this cell has. And you know, the resulting new grid, we can then display it like, like you've seen. Uh, this grid becomes the current grid then, and the next iteration of the loop starts. Now let's have a look at the rules uh, that I've mentioned. As I said, for each cell in the grid, we take a look at the number of neighbors it has. So each cell has exactly eight neighbors, as you can see here, colored in red. Um, and we specifically look at how many of those are living cells. So from now on, when I talk about neighbors, I mean living cell neighbors. Now rule number one basically says that any living cell that has less than two neighbors dies in the following generation by an effect that's called underpopulation. So in this example here, both of these cells uh, would not exist in the next generation or in the next iteration of the grid since they each have just one neighbor, which is not enough, unfortunately. Uh, rule number two states that any living cell with either two or three neighbors lives on in the next generation. So in this example here, all those living cells are kept alive for the following generation because they each have either two or three neighbors. Rule number three is that a living cell with more than three neighbors dies from an effect called overpopulation. And in this example here, the living cells uh, that are overlaid with red would die and become dead cells in the next generation. And finally, the fourth rule of the game of life is that a dead cell that is surrounded by exactly three neighbors comes alive or gets born in the next generation by what's called reproduction. You can see that the game of life kind of models nature in a way, even if it's not necessarily how it works with humans. Um, because in this example, you know, the dead cell painted in gray would become a living cell in the next generation because it has exactly those three living neighbor cells. And that's it, those four rules that we apply continuously to create every new generation of cells produces this wild simulation that you can see in the game of life. And just to give you a quick example of the variety of patterns that you can discover on a larger grid, like this is just a small example. This is not uh, like game of life on a bigger grid is something completely else. Because let's have a look at a few of the most common cell patterns that you can actually encounter if you make a larger grid. There are static ones like this. This is probably the most 
useless GIF I've created for this presentation. It's a GIF, I swear. Uh, but this pattern just doesn't change. It's stable because each living cell has exactly two or three living neighbors. So as long as no other cell comes near it, this remains in exactly this configuration. But there are also cell patterns that translate themselves, like this one, for example, here. And finally, you even can find oscillating structures like this one that periodically change between different states, but which are ultimately stable because they always just repeat the same uh, different patterns. Now, at that point, you might actually wonder, why is he telling me all about this? Like, wasn't there something about a game in the talk title? Well, here's where I was, uh, where I was at. I was looking at the Avon of Code Cave Challenge um, from the beginning, and then I was looking at my Game of Life implementation, and I began to wonder, is there maybe some kind of overlap here? Like, can I change the cellular automaton from my Game of Life to produce game levels? And if that's the case, can I even program a small roguelike game myself? By the way, as it turned out a bit later, uh, cellular automata are actually used quite often in games to create levels uh, or something like that. They even have more practical uses. But for me at that time, they were just that one tool that I discovered to maybe create cool cave maps. And that was it. Now, here's where I stood at that point. My Christmas vacation was just a few days away and I knew that between, you know, spending time with family and friends, I'd have quite a bit of free time. So um, I determined that I could spend about 30 hours on any project. So I set myself the goal to, you know, create something finished, something playable, a game prototype in those 30 hours. But before I made any more plans, however, I wanted to test my initial assumption. So here's what I intended to do. Uh, instead of, you know, living and dead cells from the game of life, I wanted to create wall and floor tiles for a cave map. And for that, I needed to heavily modify my game of life algorithm. The first thing I did was I removed completely the rule for overpopulation because I didn't want to um, create those, um, those, those ephemeral cellular organisms. I wanted massive structures of walls. And then I defined four constants that would actually drive the new algorithm. The first one was uh, what's called wall chance here in the image. Um, the first one is basically just the distribution of the two cell types like floor or wall in the initial seed. And this, as you can imagine, hugely influences the overall look of the results. The more wall cells initially exist, uh, the smaller and the more confined the resulting cave map will be. The second constant was the number of iterations or generations that the algorithm would run. So I didn't want an endless simulation like Game of Life is. I wanted to get one snapshot from it, just one generation. And ideally I would, you know, get this as fast as possible. I, do, I did not want to make the creation of one game level take like 10 seconds or anything. A player would not like this at all. And the third and fourth constants are basically just the uh, reproduction rule from the game of life and the underpopulation rule that I could tweak, you know, the values a bit. And I quickly found out that actually only a very few values make sense for those four constants. Like I imagined this would take hours or something like that to, you know, find some values that would produce what I wanted, but it was actually pretty easy. There was a sweet spot for all four of them. So it didn't take long until I had this. And what you see here is the result of my algorithm, just running repeatedly with the same configuration. So this is just one set of values for those four constants. And just from that one set, you get this stunning variety of maps. You get large and small caves. You get open and narrow caves. Sometimes they're twisted, sometimes they're straight. This is everything that I had imagined at the beginning. And it was so easy to actually produce. So you could say that my little exploratory experiment went really well but I just had cool maps for now. Now it was time for some more planning. And, you know, I let my mind wander and just thinking about all the features that I could theoretically implement, I knew that I needed to restrict myself to just a bare minimum set of features. So I came up with a list of must have features. Whoops, 
yeah, skip one slide, uh, came up with a list of must-have features for a bare-bones game prototype. Um, that comprised, first, I wanted to have a hero character, of course, that you can navigate through those uh, generated cave maps. There should be monsters, obviously, so not only did I want to implement those and their movement, I also needed a combat system of some sort, both for the hero and the monsters. And lastly, I wanted everything to look, you know, a bit pleasing, something that looks nice, that's not, you know, that you don't get the idea this is just a command line uh, application. And I figured that this was also roughly the order in which I wanted to tackle the points on this list. Well, except for one exception, but uh, I'm coming to that in a minute. Now, originally I intended to sketch out the whole game structure before I would write, you know, just another single line of code, but um, that turned out to be impossible. I wanted to use the PDAC method, you know, for everything here, but I couldn't do this. I simply couldn't anticipate all the necessary functionality. Like I was thinking about how do I actually uh, do it, like monster movement. And I, I, I had no idea, even when thinking about it, I couldn't come up with anything. So instead I decided on a more iterative approach. And that's where I could actually apply the PDAC method. I would build each system in isolation and just adapt the rest of the code as needed. So everything just had to be flexible enough that I could, you know, refactor and add new things comfortably. Um, but still, there were a few major challenges that I knew I needed to solve. And some of them very early on and some later down the road. And the first thing was that I didn't know how to actually create, you know, a compelling visual representation for my game. I had played around with the various IO methods in Ruby, but I couldn't get anywhere near my goal of uh, having my maps like appear instantly on screen whenever something changes or when the player moves or anything. You could always see some visible flickering, you know, the quick cursor movements uh, were always visible. So the solution for that was actually very simple. I just made my game a web application so that I could leverage the power of Sinatra, which is a web framework that I had quite some time to get comfortable with in the 170 course because it's a big part of that course. And I also got to use HTML and CSS, which I had at least basic knowledge of at that point in time. You know, I'm still not in the front end part of the core curriculum of launch school, but I knew a bit of HTML and CSS to get by. And the decision for a web application had some major advantages because of course I wanted to, uh, to adhere to the ASCII style of the roguelike games from the days of yore, but I could now style the result um, whoops, there it is with CSS and I could make it look more appealing than basically anything that's possible in a standard terminal. So the browser basically became like an intermediary between my game logic in the back end and the front end presentation layer. And this separation turned actually out to be very useful later on when my code base grew larger and larger and I had to think about, you know, how to organize it, but more on that in a bit. For now, what I did was I started integrating my map with some you know, general game logic like movement and a basic UI and there I was. I was able to move my little ad symbol across a generated map. And please excuse uh, the potato quality of that picture. Uh, this was taken with the smartphone in the absolute darkness uh, of my room, but I do not have any kind of picture of an early state of my game. So this will have to do. And this visual feedback, you know, this constant visual feedback was immensely satisfying and always kind of a motivating factor that kept me going even, uh, you know, when I was like in a 10 hour marathon of programming, just looking at, at this map and being able to move and, you know, implement new features and see them in action immediately. This was very, very satisfying. So I was a few hours in at that point. And now I faced the problem that I had dreaded all the way since I first became aware of it. Um, I had enemies in the game at that point, but they didn't do anything because I didn't know how to move them. And this is a fundamental problem, pathfinding. Like how do I get from point A to point B on a grid? How do I handle obstacles in the way? What's the shortest path to any destination? But not only did I need a path for my monsters to reach the player, I actually also needed to find out, for example, the range between two tiles. This was important for my combat system. And then I wanted to place the exit stairs for each level 
as far away from the player as possible. So I needed to know which cell is actually the farthest, uh, the farthest from the initial player position. And I needed something, you know, so versatile that I could have easily spent all my time, all those 30 hours devising some probably not so clever pathfinding algorithm on my own. But this was just one small part of the game. So I took to Wikipedia and I found lots of this stuff. Now, don't actually get me wrong. I wasn't really bad at math back in school. It's just that college math is now 15 years ago. So I was a bit rusty and looking at pages like this, um, this was always something that made me think, you know, this is for later. This is for when you are a professional program programmer. When you, you know, when you eat algorithms for breakfast, you drink recursive coffee in the morning and write operating systems in your spare time. But this is not for now. But that's a silly idea to think about, right? I mean, if launch school teaches you one thing, it's that you can break everything down into smaller problems and you can solve everything by just applying the PDEC method carefully. So I actually took a look at the algorithms. I read through the descriptions and I found that all those commonly used pathfinding algorithms have one thing in common. In order to solve the problem, they consider the grid as a graph. And that was good because I've worked with graphs before. Now, if you have no idea what a graph is, it's basically a data structure that's revolving around nodes that are in relationship with each other. So if we have, for example, these nodes here, um, all the graph really cares about is their connections, like from which node can you get to another node? Now you might ask, how do we actually translate this into a representation of our grid? Well, this is actually not that difficult. We just consider each cell on the grid as a node. And the graph actually doesn't care about any kind of layout, okay? It doesn't need to know or want to know that this represents a grid. All that's important for creating a graph data structure is making the connections between nodes visible to it. And in our case, these connections just represent all the movement options in our grid. So consider, for example, the green node here. All eight connections to neighboring nodes just represent the underlying grid cells neighbors or the cells that a character can move to on its turn. Now the essence of a pathfinding algorithm is how we choose to define our data structure. That's the first thing. And then to determine how we traverse all those nodes in our graph. And for that, I decided on a very simple implementation of what's known as a breadth first search. Now, breadth first search is an absolutely great fit for this problem, even though it's one of the most basic pathfinding solutions. Because breadth first search defines no weight to all the connections. Like if those nodes, for example, would represent cities, the connections might have a cost attached to them, like how far those cities are apart or how much fuel do I need to get there. But for our game grid, like every connection is just as good as the others. So, so I don't have to care about any weight between the connections uh, for those nodes. And the second thing is that it's not like a hyper-focused pathfinding algorithm. Um, it's not like only used to find one or the best path. It's useful for all the problems I have. It finds paths to all other nodes in our grid. So let's quickly walk through how breadth first search actually works. And for that, we're gonna overlay the positions of a hero character on the upper left and a monster um, in the middle to our graph. So these are basically um, the nodes in our graph that represent the position of both the monster and the player. And we wanna find out which path the monster has to take in order to get to the player. And all we know are the positions of both in our grid. Now to reduce the amount of nodes a bit, let's add a few walls to this. Um, meaning that those are just, you know, impassable nodes. And again, the graph doesn't care that those are walls. It just needs to know that there are now less connections between certain nodes. And if you're at that point wondering what a node actually is in Ruby terms, well, it can be anything. It can be just an array that holds the necessary information, or it can be like in the case of my game, a custom object that provides easy access to all the related data. But the implementation details actually don't matter here. This is all about the mental model of what's happening. Now, we traverse our graph as we go. So initially we just have one node in our graph. This is the green one. That's where the monster is. We now check for all possible connections from there. 
And for that, we can, yeah, we can look at our grid map that's underlying and see which tiles are adjacent and would be targets for possible movement. We can ignore walls since we can't move there. So in this example here, that leaves us with four nodes colored in red. And the important thing is that we now store those in a queue so that we can explore them later. Because right now, all we want to do is save information about those newly found nodes. The first thing is the distance from the original tile to those nodes. And in this case, it's very easy. It's just one since those are the first connections. Um, what we also save is information about the path it took to get to this node. And again, in this case, it's very simple. The only move necessary for a monster right now is to follow that one connection to the new node. And what we do now is follow the same steps again, moving to nodes that we take from our queue of nodes to explore. Let's start with that one on the left. The first thing is, again, we determine which other nodes are connected to it. We ignore walls, but we can also ignore the nodes that we've already, already visited. And that leaves us with these two nodes that again, get added to our queue. And we again, save more information like the distance to the original node. And we do that by just adding one to the previous nodes uh, saved value. And the same goes for the path. And the next thing would be that we would explore another one of the upper right nodes next, because breadth first search, like the name says, means that we explore them in the order in which they were added to our, to our queue. So we would finish exploring all the nodes in a distance of one before we explore those farther away. And once that queue is empty, we get this. We now have information for every node, for each and every node, both the distance to the original node, as well as the path or the nodes um, that it took to travel to get there. And that's basically it. This is breadth first search. And I deliberately did not show any actual code here because the code is always just the last step. You know, Creating this mental model of how the algorithm works is the most important thing. And you know, implementing it, typing it out in code is pretty straightforward in the end. So I threw this in my game and here you can see how this actually works on one of my uh, one of my generated maps and for the size of the maps that i had and they are relatively small this uh, algorithm ran extremely fast even though it's you know essentially brute forcing every tile on the map yeah like this is of course not the real speed this is just for visualization purposes right um and you know with this algorithm i had everything i needed for all my pathfinding issues and now that's the flashy part of my game. This is the cool thing uh, that you can always visualize and wow people with. But the biggest problem I had afterwards was one that is less visually interesting, but became the most important lesson of all. And that was concerning code organization. Now I noticed that by integrating one feature after the other, like the pathfinding, my program became a bit messy. And it's not that the individual components were badly written or anything. I did regularly refactor them to keep them, you know, neat and tidy, but the integration part uh, was worrying me. My overall program structure was on the way to become a web of entangled responsibilities and every system in it was liberally communicating with all the other systems. And that meant that more and more often uh, a change to, for example, the map would have some unforeseen side effects and suddenly make, let's say, the log file no longer work correctly. And that was obviously bad. Now, I cannot claim to have solved this problem at all. But only reading a bit more about these issues made me realize that there's a whole new layer to programming that I didn't pay much attention to until that point. I became aware of what's called object-oriented design. And object-oriented design basically describes how you arrange your object-oriented code in order to manage or let's say better to reduce dependencies so that each of your components uh, or objects can actually tolerate change easily. Now, most of us, or maybe not, might be vaguely aware of things like design patterns. You've probably heard of this. Um, but seeing the actual need for them was actually an eye opener for me. So I refactored a few things, shuffled some things around uh, about how my code integrated. But it was actually only after I had reached my goal, after I was finished, that I could seriously start reading up on several of the more clever ways to organize code um, 
so that this code then shares those principles of good object oriented design. But still, looking back at what I did in those 30 hours, like having this result in the end, I think my efforts were at least moderately successful. I mean, I had a game prototype, it was working, it looked quite nice, and it had all its basic functionality that uh, was on my initial list. Now, I could talk about lots of other interesting uh, stuff that I encountered um, during this project. And if you have any questions about some specific aspect, I'm always happy to answer uh, either after this presentation or you can uh, you know, ping me in Slack. But if there's one thing I wanna emphasize at the end, it's this. If you are, let's say a few months into launch school and you're curious right now, like you're following the core curriculum because that's what you're supposed to do. But you maybe you have this idea in your head of some cool uh, things that you wanna do. My advice would be make this a side project. Shoot for something that might even seem a bit too ambitious if you want. And you might find that launch school with its PDEG approach actually prepares you quite well to solve many of the problems you'll encounter on your way. Because in general, it's nothing more than just small problems all the way down. You can break up everything into smaller and smaller pieces and then tackle each problem after the other. And understanding at the most basic level how, for example, uh, a breath first search works can lead you to even more uh, exploration. Like for example, I wanna show you this. Um, I unfortunately couldn't finish this before this presentation. I tried really hard until like half an hour before the presentation started, but I just couldn't get it to work fully. So I'm not seeing a GIF, but this is one output of a, an algorithm that generates rooms instead of caves. Because if you remember the NetHack screenshot from the beginning, um, you were seeing those rooms and I was really curious how, how that actually works. And quite to my surprise, this uses something that's called binary space partitioning. It doesn't matter how that works in detail, but it uses a graph, a, a special kind of graph, a binary tree. And you're basically dividing the dungeon into smaller and smaller parts in which you in the end create rooms and then you connect those rooms. But the basic principles behind all those algorithms it always comes down to the same stuff. If I understand graphs, I have no problem understanding this binary space partitioning. And that's basically the end note for this presentation. Um, if you just dig a bit deeper, if you do something that might not be part of the core curriculum, but something that you know interests you personally, you can do some cool stuff. And with that, I'm actually finished here and I'm now open to any questions that you might have you know just pop it into the zoom chat box and i'm going to try and answer them and if there are none i'm just gonna yeah i can tell you uh, if you're interested in the code of my game you can actually find it i'm not including a link here in the presentation but you can find the three-part blog series that I wrote about this project on the, uh, in the sharing section of launchschool.com. And I've basically plastered the URL to the GitHub repository uh, quite a few times um, on those blog entries. And if there are no questions. There is one question in the chat box, so. Why do I not see this? Let me quickly see. I just have this Q&A box here and I'm not seeing, can you read, can you read the question? On the, on the right side, uh, there was a orange, orange box when you hovered over it. So press that. Yeah, so on the right oh, side. Oh, that one. I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah. Um, my question is, how many hours did you study each day? Well, not a lot. I'm working full-time, actually. I have a 40 hour per week full-time job. So, you know, my study time is actually pretty limited. I'm trying to get at least two hours a day and a lot more on the weekend, but yeah, sometimes it works out and sometimes not. And doing a project of that scope was just possible because I had my Christmas vacation. I wouldn't have done this probably during the regular study time. So uh, having those 30 hours uninterrupted during Christmas was the only way that I could actually tackle something like this. And yeah, thanks to Nathan and uh, for the, uh, you know, nice words. Uh, I hope There's also a question now at uh, Q&A. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, the question is, did you consider using a language other than Ruby or was there too much mental overhead? Well, I don't know that much more than Ruby. I know a bit of JavaScript, but using Ruby just came naturally because that was what we learned in the backend part of launch school. So there was no question actually to use anything else. This was what I was familiar with at, uh, with at the time. And I was doing the front end uh, part with a bit of JavaScript and I realized how bad and rusty I got at JavaScript. So since I was not at the front end part yet, I was not learning the JavaScript, HTML, and CSS parts of launch school. So Ruby was just really the one thing that I truly enjoyed because of the strong fundamentals that launch school gave me. Um, so yeah, there was no question at all at any point to use any other language than Ruby. Uh, Will Lothring asks if it's possible or if I have considered launching this with, Her I think he means Heroku. Um, I thought about this for a while, but this would have meant some drastic changes in the back end. Right now you can basically throw this up Heroku, but, uh, Heroku, but everyone who visits the URL gets to play on the same game. So you do an input and if someone else plays at the same time, he can, you know, basically mess up your whole game. And rewriting this to, you know, allow for multiple players I thought about this for a while, but this just didn't fit in the timetable that I had set myself. This was just not possible. I'd love to do this in the future maybe, but right now this is just, you know, clone the repo and run this yourself locally because it wouldn't make sense to actually have an online version where everyone plays the same game at the same time. Um, James Wilson asked, what's some advice you would give those that are getting ready to enroll in the core curriculum? Just um, the thing is, this might sound like I'm advising you to, you know, do all the great stuff that you might have in mind, but I think the most important thing in the beginning is just follow what launch school, uh, just follow the curriculum, like trust in the launch school process. And this might not yield immediate results, like you're not going to say after two weeks, oh, wow, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm such, a, such a good programmer after two weeks, but you look back at certain points in the core curriculum and realize the huge amount of progress that you made. Like after I finished this game, I looked back and I thought, wow, this would not have been possible just four months ago. Like at that point I was into launch school like eight months. So this was the exact right time to tackle such a project. Any, any point before would have probably not made sense or would, made, would have made it much more difficult, but just trusting in the process, trusting in the, in the you know order that law school throws topics at you is such an important part. Just keep at it, be consistent, and follow law school, and you're gonna arrive at that point. This is nothing special, and this is what I want to emphasize uh, emphasize with this talk. This is not some magic thing, or this is not something that that you know just I was able to do. You can do this too. There is no magic behind this. This is just PDEC applied all the way. Um, yeah, I hope this uh, answers at least part of the questions. Um, Stephanie asks, would you say implementing Conway's Game of Life would be a good project for someone in uh, 120? Definitely. I think Game of Life, as you can see, this is just a simple loop. Like you do a simple Ruby loop and have a few if clauses for all those rules. You can do this in probably at the end of 101. And I really encourage you to do this. Game of Life is something that just looks amazing and that gives you this immensely satisfying feedback of having something on your screen that's moving and you you can tweak those rules you can see what happens if you for example you know change some of the values that make the game of life just look up uh, game of life on wikipedia you can find those four rules uh, that i've mentioned and you can implement this in in a very simple way this is definitely doable in 120 so yeah go go for this uh, Sina Mayo asks, if it's not too personal, would you mind discussing your prior experience, if any, with programming prior to Alice? Oh, wow, yeah. Um, I do have a background in programming, you could say. I'm, I've been on and off uh, of programming like for basically 20 years, starting very early on, but I never had anything, you know, serious. This was never serious. I never considered this a career for most of the time. I was just, you know, toying around with it. And my programming knowledge was really bad. The stuff that I wrote was embarrassingly bad. And that's what finally, when I started to, you know, try to get into a career of programming, um, 
that's when I realized how bad of a program I am. I was trying to, you know, self-teach myself uh, web development for like about a year or a year and a half before joining launch school. And it was very bad. The results were absolutely not convincing. I never felt like I could even tackle something of this scope. I couldn't have done this project, for example, at any point in time before launch school. So I did have programming experience that makes a, some things a bit easier, probably, when you have just awareness of a few things. But I learned to be a better programmer at launch school, like any kind of good programmer at all at launch school. Before, this was just, you know, hobby type of stuff. Okay. Thanks again for the great questions, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed this talk and I, I wish you all a great evening. Thanks, Barat. Yeah, special shout outs to Barat and um, to Barat Agarbal and Catherine Emon. We have a small study group and there's such a huge encouragement all the way, like it's great to bounce, of idea, uh, bounce ideas of each other to, you know, solve things together. This played a huge part in, uh, in you know my journey in launch school, just having this this small study group. This is amazing. So thanks to you.